Well, welcome to uh, today's Safer by Design webinar. And uh, we have uh, a very important, exciting topic today in the area of new approach methods uh, in an area um, uh, of importance, reproductive toxicology, which, which places a, a great demand on, on testing systems. Um, and today we're going to discuss the use of zebrafish alternatives uh, as a new approach method to evaluate tetragenicity. Very happy to have Roberto Hernan, the R&D manager from BioVive in Spain, joining me uh, to, to give an interesting presentation, which will take about 20 minutes or so. And just to remind everyone at the end, uh, we always have a discussion session and you can enter your questions into the question box um, on the panel. With that, I hand over to you, Roberto. Please go ahead. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. Um, I'll start by, by uh, entangling the webinar again, teratogenicity assay in the zebrafish alternative model under the ICHS 5R3 guideline on reproductive toxicology perspective. So please allow me first to introduce a little bit uh, our company, BioVive. We are a contract research organization that have more than 60 years experience now. We specialize pretty much on, on zebrafish as an animal model. Uh, we offer tailor-made preclinical services to different sectors, including pharmaceutical, biotech, chemical, cosmetic, and tobacco companies. We work worldwide and under the GLPs, and of course, the, the three R's, which uh, I'll explain in a minute. We are based here in, in Spain, in, in Europe. This is where our headquarters and wet labs are. Although we also have a business development office in, in Boston, Massachusetts. So what is the big problem in, in pharma? As you probably know, in drug discovery and development, there are thousands and thousands of, of compounds going into a kind of a black box that we have here. And at the end of the day, there is only one compound successful for the market. So there is a huge need to enhance productivity and minimize the risk in the R&D process. This has to be somehow uh, hand with hand with the regulators. And the regulators mandate the, the three R's principle, which is the replacement, the reduction, and the refinement of the animals. For example, this, these regulators here, the European Union Reference Laboratory, or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and the International Council for Harmonization, they are um, advised on, on using this three R principle. Furthermore, the United States Environmental Protection Agency by 2025 will reduce by 30% already the, the cost in mammals. And by 2035, uh, they say all mammal studies will stop funding, eliminating them. So there is a, a clear uh, push to, to use alternative methods other than animals. Um, as an example, the, the ECVAM uh, advice using the zebrafish embryo acute toxicity method for aquatic toxicity. The OECD uh, guidelines include already a zebrafish animal as, as a recommendation to assess for safety chemical compounds uh, following the OECD guidelines you see in the, in the screen. And the European Community Regulation for Cosmetics forbids uh, already all testing in, in, in animals. And therefore, um, an alternative uh, model is pretty much uh, a must. An important note to, to highlight here is that you might not know that the superfish embryo under the uh, European Directive uh, 102063 EU are not considered animals when they are under five days post fertilization. That gives us uh, um, an opportunity to exploit this, this window, uh, which is an, an excellent uh, model for that. And so we have different alternative methods. Uh, all the way from in vitro to mammals, as you can see in this panel, uh, with different uh, parameters that uh, have a, a cost increasing, as you can see from left to right, uh, the cost is higher as we move uh, towards the mammals. 
the capacity, in other words, the throughput, which decreases is the other way around. There is a high throughput in in vitro assays, such as cells, for example, going down to mammals, which is a very low throughput for obvious reasons. And the biological relevance uh, again increases, having lowest relevance in in vitro models and highest in, in mammals, which are very close to humans, as you know. But if we want to frame this under the three R's, the replacement reduction and refinement, we have to move between in vitro models and zebrafish, including the, the cells, the flies, the sea elegans, and of course the zebrafish. As you can see, the zebrafish alternative model is the most balanced model in terms of cost efficiency, capacity of throughput, and biologic relevance. This can be seen here in this diagram as well, where we can see on the on the left bottom side of the of the diagram um, low reproducibility biological uh, information uh, manual in vitro screening okay uh, is time efficient but uh, it's not uh, sorry it's not time efficient and it's not uh, a biological complex method the cells for example are automated and, and that is an advantage however they are not a biological uh, complex process either. On the other opposite side, we have the, the mouse, we have the, the mammals, which are very uh, competent for, for studying complexity um, systems. However, the, the repro reproducibility and, and productivity of this animal is, is, is uh, undermined. And therefore, on the, on the top here, we have a high throughput automated animal that can be automated with a biological complexity because it's a whole animal, it's not only a cell type. So um, we, can, we can see the advantages of, this, uh, of the zebrafish because the genetic homology with humans is high as well in terms of um, of diseases with, uh, related to, to humans, so more than 80% homology. The development of the organs is very fast. In, in, in a couple of days, uh, the most three, we have all the organs formed. The small size of these animals, especially when they are uh, embryos and larvae, uh, make them uh, screenable in well plates, like uh, in 96 well plates, for example, like in cells. We have a high productivity of up to 300x per couple. The embryos are totally transparent, embryos and, and larvae as well, uh, and that makes us um, uh, make it a, an advantage to, to see what's going on inside the, inside the animal without having to sacrifice the fish. And of course, there is a low maintenance of, of, the, of these facilities. In terms of uh, timing, you can see in this in this timeline on the bottom how at very few hours post fertilization uh, all the organs can be formed all the way to 120, and that gives us the opportunity, for example, to check up um, specific toxicities such as uh, liver toxicity, hearing toxicities, neurotoxicity, kidney, immunotoxicity, or cardiotoxicity. Last but not least, we have the acute toxicity and teratoxicity assays, very common assays in uh, using zebrafish, because they resolve in, in very few hours post fertilization in the very early stages, as you can see here. Again, highlighting the European directive, uh, where larvae, when they start feeding, they become independent animals. And that is right here at this point. From here to the left, they are not considered animals okay so the international council for harmonization s5 r3 guideline on reproductive toxicology proposed an alternative testing and and provide us with a reference compound list that contains a total of 32 compounds 29 compounds that were teratogenic for for mice and three negative compounds this is an important reference um, uh, list. And we, all we want 
to, to do is to translate the, the significance of, of this list that happened in, in teratogenicity uh, uh, compounds, teratogenic compounds, sorry, in mice, translate it into zebrafish. So our goal was to predict the developmental toxicity of these compounds in the zebrafish according to, the, to this guideline. Okay, for that, we set up a teratotoxicity assay in which um, we use a zebrafish expressing a green fluorescent protein in the heart. And the first thing we need to do is a dose range finding test. Dose range finding test, just to, to have an idea of how toxic, uh, where the toxicity is around a wide range of uh, concentrations. Once we have that, we carry on with a developmental toxicity assay. So the dose range finding assay, uh, we used five different concentrations from 0.1 to 1,000 micromolar, 10 embryos per condition, uh, five embryos per well in 24 well plate assay, and a control group vehicle treated embryos only. Once we have that, we carry on with the developmental toxicity assay using eight concentrations that were chosen to, to be more precise, uh, chosen based on the dose range finding uh, assay above. And for this, we use 15 embryos per condition, treated in 24 well plates at five uh, embryos per well. We use again the control group, uh, they, call, they call treated embryos only, and this time we use a positive control, which is the retinoic acid that we know is teratogenic. So plates are incubated at the physiological temperature of these animals, which is 28.5 uh, degrees Celsius. And the embryos were analyzed at two and four or five days per fertilization. So we obtained uh, different alterations, malformations as, as expected, because we, we know from the guide that these compounds were in the majority um, um, teratogenic. And as you can see, different uh, malformations here, cranio, craniofacial uh, malformation, otic vesicles, um, malformation of the, of the heart, different body shape, the cow dolphin, the yolk, necrotic tissues, the uh, delayed hatching as well. So all of them were checked at two different time points, as you can see here. This is an example of just uh, one of the compounds and uh, where we could analyze the LC50, lethal, lethal concentration 50, and they have maximum um, effective concentration 50 values, CC50. Okay, and based on these values, we obtain a teratogenic index calculated as the ratio between LC50 divided by EC50 for each time point. Uh, you can see here this, this number obtaining for this particular example of this compound, obtaining a teratogenic index above 13 in the day two and in the day four, 145. So, based on previously uh, published results and um, uh, papers, articles such as the Selder Labs, uh, and also in BioBytes internal validation that we carried on, BioByte proposes a cutoff of uh, the ter teratogenic index of two. That means that in this classification, we have uh, three possibilities. First of all, non toxic. Of course, uh, normal, uh, normal embryos that have no affect affectation whatsoever. But if the teratogenic index is two or above two, there is a, uh, likely to be teratogenic that compound. However, if, if it's below two, this teratogenic index, uh, it's going to be toxic, but likely not teratogenic. So the higher the teratogenic index value, the higher the teratogenic potential. Here, uh, we have just an example of a particular compound with the EC50 and LC50 calculated and at two different time points and obtaining a teratogenic index of 3.36 and 3.07 respectively for these time points. So this compound is likely to be teratogenic. 
Okay, these are some examples of the study that we obtained. As you can see, different teratogenic uh, compounds here, named on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, the, the samples were, were run as, as so the whole study in 96 well plates. And we can see the malformations, including the craniofacial mal malformations, the trunk malformations, and the pericardial edema as well. These are common malformations for teratogenic in, um, toxicities. So here you can see a very rich uh, table uh, which includes the whole uh, reference list by the ICH and uh, all these compounds, a total of 32, three of them were uh, known to be negative or non teratogenic uh, and 29 were teratogenic. So we could establish one by one either the non-observable adverse effects level, well, okay, right here, two and four days per, uh, post fertilization, the EC50 and LC50 values, as I said before, okay, again for both time points, and the teratogenic index dividing LC50 by EC50, okay. So according to that, we obtain a, a color tagging, which is more visible, uh, to identify the correctly classified compounds as green, the orange ones, non-conclusive results, we'll see why, mainly to solubility problems, and the red ones, in this case two, that were not correctly classified according to the, to the compound list, uh, list by, by provided by the ICH, and we'll see why. 23 out of the 29 positive compounds evaluated correctly. Okay, so they are all the green ones. But four of them, as I said, had restricted uh, problems uh, due to solubility problems. So that is one thing that we need to improve, solubility of these compounds. Um, but if we focus, for example, in, the, in, in one of the compounds that were for us as non marked as non-toxic, which is the aspirin right here on the top, Right. We found out that uh, it acidifies the medium, and that, that is a problem uh, for for the for the treatment itself, and so it was negative for us. However, the three negative compounds that the ICH uh, reference list provided were also correctly um, identified as negative for us, and that is why we have a specificity of 100% for this assay. Um, with a sensitivity and accuracy close to 80%, which is uh, higher than the minimum required, but ECBAN. So we're we're in the right track. What's the future work to do? Because this needs to be back up with, with more work. Well, one of the obvious things to do is, is to check for the bioavailability. Uh, what does this mean? This means that uh, there are other procedures, uh, chemical procedures, such as uh, LCMS um, that, that uh, look at the concentration uh, spectrophotometry, mass spectrophotometry and mass mass, look at the concentration that the embryos have inside the cell, inside the bodies, the real concentration, rather than assuming the, that the drug is entering the embryo. So we can actually determine false negative compounds that, could, uh, that can be detected in this assay. Okay, so this is to be done. And uh, another thing that needs to be done is as well, as well to, to do some more replicates and try to, to make this as a more reproducible. So in the end, we can actually um, use the several fish as an alternative model and, and avoid using the models uh, following this, this guideline. Well, finally, you can see here some of the, some of the publications we have as, as, as the company in, in zebrafish, as we are one of the leaders in, in the world for, for this animal model. And from here, I'll take uh, questions or enter into, into a discussion. Thank you for your time.